How about now? Can you hear me now? All right, so should, should I start? Okay, so um, I'm very pleased um, to, that you're here today. I'm David Pitt, I'm the chair of the philosophy department. And we have with us today, uh, Dr. Ike Anya. Dr. Anya is a consultant in public health medicine working in Nigeria and the United Kingdom, most recent, recently supporting the National Health Service response to COVID in Scotland. He's an honorary lecturer in public health at Imperial, Imperial College and teaches at Bristol University and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. A 2007 TED Global Fellow, he co-founded and serves on the board of Nigeria Health Watch, EpiAfric, TEDx Houston, and the Abuja Library Society. He's an advisory council member of the AKO Kane Prize for African Writing and is published in The Guardian, Huffington Post, Granta, Catapult, and Eclectica, and in the Anthology of Writers by Nigeria, uh, Anthology of Essays by Nigerian Writers on Nigeria, called Of This Our Country. He is co-editor of the Weaver Bird Collection of New Nigerian Writing and has a master's in creative nonfiction from the University of East Anglia. He's also the author of the book that he's going to be talking to us um, about. So um, I'm so let me go back to my text. Dr. Anya, whom I'm happy and proud to count among my very good friends, will be talking with us about his wonderful book, Small by Small, Becoming a Doctor in 90s Nigeria. Dr. Anya will speak and read from his book for approximately an hour, after which we'll open the floor for questions and discussion, and a catered reception in the courtyard will follow. So I'd like, before I introduce Ike, I would like to thank the Department of Pan-African Studies, um, the Martin Delaney Pan-African MD Pass to Medical School Program, and the Cal State LA Department of, of Public Health for partnering with the philosophy department in support of this event. Thanks are also due to the Philosophy Club and especially his president, Edie Markovich, for their work in organizing today's talk and securing us this venue. And also thanks to the Philosophy Department's Administrative Support Coordinator, Jakari Carlisle, for his help in organizing and advertising the event. To Dr. Andre Ellis of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Belonging for his advice. And to Owen Miller for his AV Tech wizardry. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Ike Anya. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, David, uh, Professor Pitt, and thank you everyone who has been involved in organizing this and um, to the audience, uh, both those here in Los Angeles and those who might be joining the live stream from different parts of the world. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be here today. I feel honored and privileged to be given the opportunity to talk about um, my first book, um, small by small, becoming a doctor in 1990s Nigeria. I'm going to um, combine this with a bit about talking about the, who I am, the journey to writing this book, and uh, reading excerpts as well from the book. And then hopefully there'll be a chance for questions. So in terms of who I am, I think the um, starting point is actually a small university town in southeastern Nigeria uh, called Onsoka, which is where I spent most of my childhood. Um, I was born in Enugu, not far from Onsoka, and um, my, per my father was an academic teaching at this university, and in many ways I say that was perhaps the first um, privilege I had, being born into such a community that uh, had a very strong literary tradition. Um, at a point in my childhood, we lived next door to the famous Nigerian writer who is sometimes called the father of African literature, Chinua Achebe. And um, not long after his family moved out, having been our neighbors for about 10 years, the family that moved into that house next door on the university campus was the family of the um, Adichies, whose daughter, Chimamanda, uh, went on to become another, um, or has gone on to become another famous um, 
Nigerian writer. And so in some ways I inherited this literary heritage and it was very much a part of my growing up. And I was um, a child who loved to read. I was a very precocious reader. And um, I happened to share the same birthday as um, Chino Achebe, who lived next door to us, the 16th of November. And so I remember as a child being taken on our joint birthdays, sometimes to this house to um, have a glass of soft drink with him uh, and to celebrate. And so in some ways, perhaps that was some of the early inspiration. So I'm going to read a bit from um, this uh, book, which basically covers um, my going into medical school and the years of medical school until the first year of qualifying as a doctor and having worked for the first year. So that's roughly the period covered. But I'm going to read a bit from um, childhood to perhaps give a sense of the uh, childhood I'm talking about. The sandpit is under a frangipani tree from which a few pink blossoms have fallen onto the sand. The rest of the well-kept garden is strewn with toys and a jungle gym. It is break time at our nursery school, a small block of classrooms built out of corrugated zinc sheets on a concrete base in the garden of our headmistress's home. It is in a quiet close in the part of the university campus where the lecturers live. Her husband is a lecturer at the university in Nsuka like my father, also teaching zoology. I am tired of queuing to play with the steering wheel lying in one corner of the sand pit. Extracted from a derelict car, it is popular at break time, causing more than one playground fight. We all want to sit in the sand pit to stretch our legs out on either side of the steering shaft and turn the wheel this way and that. From time to time, we pause to pull at the gear levers on one side, imit imitating our parents' driving. I pick up an empty tin of SMA baby milk from the grass beside the sand pit. My friend Ozurumba is building a sand house on the grass by the path to our classroom block, a short distance away. I decide to join him. I fill the tin with sand and run towards Uzurumba with this fresh supply. In my haste, I stumble on a rock hidden in the grass and fall. The sharp edges on the inside of the tin cut through my fingers and I hit my head on the sharp edge of the race path. I begin to cry. There is blood everywhere. A teacher runs forward, grabs me, and takes me into the classroom. She tries to staunch the blood with swabs of cotton wool and gauze from the first aid box by her desk. She does not have much success. The headmistress appears and scoops me up from the low chair in which I am sitting, whimpering. Rushing me to her car, she deposits me in the passenger seat and drives off. We approach the medical center, a cluster of wooden prefabricated buildings on a small hill at the edge of the university campus. I am scared as we approach. It is where my parents take us when we are ill, usually with malaria, and a visit there often means painful injections. I am taken into the treatment room with its pale green mobile screens. It is the place where the painful chloroquine injections for malaria are given although they are not as painful as the Novalgene injections. The worst I hear when we compare notes in the playground is crystal pen, which repeatedly stings as it goes in. Thankfully, I have never had to have it. A doctor appears summoned by one of the nurses. He lifts me onto the couch in a corner of the treatment room. A table nearby is laid out with equipment. I hear him say he will need stitches then I fall asleep. Perhaps I have been sedated or perhaps I am simply exhausted from crying. I wake up to see the nurse securing a plaster over the wound above my left eyebrow. There is a strong smell of iodine. The wounds on the back of my fingers are dressed with iodine-soaked swabs, which are left to dry. 
I acquired dark yellow brown knuckles. I'm given a tetanus injection. I try to be brave and not cry as the nurse and the headmistress murmur, good boy, brave boy. The headmistress takes me home. I do not remember going back to have the stitches removed. For the next few days, there are daily visitors to our house. Each time my mother repeats the story, her voice rising. He had to have four stitches, four stitches. Later, I go back to school. The plaster still over my left eyebrow, a badge of honor that my friends gather to look at. With time, it begins to itch. Then finally, one day, it is removed, leaving a scar. A year or so later, I sit again in the dirt, this time in the front yard of our compound, just beyond the veranda which welcomes visitors to a bungalow. I am somewhere between the lawn, dotted with the flower bushes my mother lovingly tends, and the head separating our house from the road. I clutch a bright yellow plastic stethoscope and a box with the rest of my new present, a doctor's set. Where has it come from? I cannot remember. I think it is a birthday present from my parents, or perhaps it is from my generous godfather, Uncle Mike. He lives on the same street two houses away and often brings me presents from his trips to academic engineering conferences abroad. His presents elicit some envy from my brothers whose godparents do not match mine in thoughtfulness. I take out the blue plastic kidney bowl and drop the red toy thermometer into it. It is the school holidays, so my mother, who teaches biology at a boys' secondary school in town, is spending more time at home. She is teaching me to read using the ladybird books with Peter and Jane. I am waiting for her to finish some chores before our next reading lesson, perhaps clearing away the breakfast things. My elder brother kicks a football back and forth against the garage wall. I alternate between playing doctor and watching him. Suddenly, there are footsteps running to the kitchen door on the other side of the house. Wondering what is happening, I stand up and with my brother, run through the front door into the kitchen. My mother stands there with my aunts, my father's two youngest sisters who are spending the holidays with us. My aunts are panting, beads of sweat on their brows. They recite in a breathless chorus, we were halfway to the market. When we saw Mrs. Melifong, she asked us to go back home. We should not be out. There has been a coup and there may be a curfew. My mother goes into the living room, murmuring soothing words, my aunt trailing her. She turns on the radio, a magnificent suitcase-sized box that takes pride of place in our living room. We do not yet have a television, but our next door neighbors, the Akwilos, do. On some evenings, I sleep illicitly through a gap in the garden fence in my pajamas to join their children in front of the large brown box with golden legs. When it is time, we watch their father, the only person allowed to touch it, pull back the sliding door covering the screen of the television to switch it on. Once it is on, we huddle on the floor in front of it, captivated by its grainy pictures and fuzzy sounds. This morning, my mother turns on the radio and the grown-ups surround it, heads bent low, ears close to the speakers, as if scared of missing a single word. There is music and then a man's stern voice, speaking rapidly. My mother and my aunts whisper to each other. Apparently, someone called Gowan has been overthrown. Gowan is our head of state. His handsome, mustachioed face smiles from beneath his peaked military cap, often on the cover of the newspapers the vendor delivers to a house each morning. But what is this word overthrew? My five-year-old self imagines someone lifted up in a chair and thrown over something, a cliff perhaps, up in the air. I add this new word together with coup and curfew to my rapidly growing vocabulary. These are some of the scenes I remember whenever I am asked, when did you first decide to become a doctor? I do not remember deciding anything that day. No one makes any kind of serious career choice at the age of five. And yet, 
The memory of that day, sitting in the dirt at the front of the house, yellow stethoscope in hand, has stayed with me. So that's a sort of glimpse I thought reading that bit would give an example of what my childhood was like, both in terms of my precautious reading, in terms of the fact that I grew up under a military government in Nigeria where coups uh, were uh, a matter of fact, uh, part of everyday life, and um, where as you can see, there was rapid social change happening in terms of um, television coming to Nigeria more um, widely um, to everyone. And so as a child who loved to read, it was almost inevitable that at some point I would start trying to write my own um, short stories, my own little um, fairy tales, my own um, attempts at writing a book. And I always had that ambition that I would um, one day write a book, but I wasn't to know then that it would probably take another um, four decades plus before I was to um, actually f have that dream fulfilled. Uh, from primary school, in the small university town of Onsuka, which I've only just discovered that um, uh, one of the professors here, uh, Ukizi, who I just met, also attended the same primary school, which is uh, quite a coincidence. From there, I went on to a boarding school in Lagos, which was um, a very different experience. It was uh, a very old, school which was had been set up by the colonial government. It was called King's College in Lagos. And that's where, um, if you like, my next um, my next um, attempt or the whole idea of becoming a doctor began to crystallize. And so I'm going to read a bit from uh, my account of part of secondary school. She strides into the wooden floored classroom, sure-footed and statesque, taking her place at the front in the gap between the rows of desks occupied by a class of 11-year-olds and the blackboard. We hear her heels clacking on the concrete corridor, leading to our classroom even before she arrives. We smell her rich fruity perfume before we see her. I know what the scent is. It's poison by Christian Dior. I have seen the bulbous purple and gold bottle with its crystalline cap sitting on my glamorous Auntie Min's dressing table. Mrs. Amobi strides back and forth in front of the blackboard, elegant in her shoulder padded suit, the perfect scarlet ovals of her nails sweeping through the air as she gesticulates. Each movement seems to release a gust of poisoned air that floats through the rapidly warming classroom. She asks us to open our general science textbooks lying neatly on our desks before us. The textbooks that we use, the same one used by first year secondary pupils across Nigeria, is actually a textbook of integrated science. But at our school, the subject is still called general science. It is probably something to do with tradition. Ours is one of the oldest schools in the country. The first set up by the colonial government and a lot of emphasis is laid on doing things the King's College way. Mrs. Amobi is teaching us about cells, how in the human body they aggregate to form tissues, which themselves form organs and how the organs form systems and systems the body. She pauses from time to time to scribble in chalk on the blackboard, but the alchemy of her strong perfume and the tropical afternoon sun seems to induce in us a stultifying lethargy. With something of a sense of relief, we watch her clap her hands, releasing a flurry of chalk, announcing that the lesson is over and promising to see us again next week. Hers is the last lesson period before break time, 
and we pour out into the corridors, heading for the talk shop to buy biscuits and soft drinks at the kiosk, or just to loiter for those whose pocket money does not run to such luxuries. After break, we settle back into class. One of the older boys, a prefect, four years ahead of us, walks in on an errand. He sniffs the air exaggeratedly and then says, ah, I see you have had a general science lesson today. At the beginning of our fourth year, we are asked to choose subjects. From the 16 subjects of our junior secondary school years, we are expected to pick between seven and nine. We will concentrate on these ahead of our final senior secondary certificate exam in three years time. Most of my classmates with a natural affinity for either the sciences or the arts find this process fairly straightforward. My more eclectic tastes mean that I struggle to drop any subjects. So I pick literature, history, and economics alongside further mathematics, physics, chemistry, and biology. I find dropping French the most difficult choice. I have studied it since primary school and always done well in it. All of Nigeria's neighboring countries are French speaking and I have vague dreams of a life in the diplomatic service. These dreams are probably inspired by my cousin recently posted to the Nigerian embassy in Sweden. A few days before the deadline for choosing subjects, in desperation, I seek the top student in the final year French class for advice. Breaching protocol and visiting a senior classroom without an invitation, I timidly approach him during prep one night and ask, can you speak fluent French now? He smiles patronizingly. Oh no, I can read large paragraphs of grammar and answer questions on them. I can carry out basic conversations, but no, I can't understand anything too complicated. I am horrified. What then is the point of continuing with French if one cannot speak fluent French at the end of it? No, I will not pick French. Instead, when I am older, I will go on a crash course, the kind advertised at the back of the Reader's Digest magazines I devour voraciously. Learn French in three weeks. I pick economics instead, eager to understand the business pages and the impenetrable stock market listings of the newspapers that my father brings home daily. The day after I hand in my subject choices, I bump into the French mistress, the usually taciturn Madame Achubu in the school corridors. Good morning, ma, I greet her, standing to one side to allow her to pass. Anya, she says, I hear you are dropping French. Y yes, I stammer, launching into an explanation of how I enjoy so many different subjects and how I have had a really difficult time choosing, even doing nine subjects. I still want to learn French later, I offer in propitiation. That's a pity, she says, cutting me off and walking away. You were one of our best French students and we had really high hopes for you. I watch her receding figure and stand by the wood panel staircase, biting my nails. So that was how I ended up, um, without actually ever picking a choice of studying medicine, it was just that in our school, um, which was a very highly competitive boys school, um, with high academic standards, it was more or less expected that if you were a good student, um, you either read medicine or you read engineering. And then there was a handful of people who, well, didn't really get on well with science subjects. And so they inevitably read law. And then a few people who knew how to draw who had the gift of drawing, they were destined to read architecture. And it wasn't anything that anyone expressly said to us, but it was more or less assumed that this would happen. And it wasn't until I started working on this book that I started thinking about when exactly did I choose to become a doctor? When did I choose medicine as a career? And all I could come up with were these fragments you know, the five-year-old me playing with um, the doctor's set uh, and then this medical, um, this secondary school experience of picking subjects. 
And it occurred to me that there wasn't a specific point I could put my finger on as being the point where I chose to become a doctor. And one of the things that I became interested in in the process of writing this book, and I hoped to try and achieve, was to try and answer the question of how do you go from an 18-year-old school liver, fairly naive, knowing very little about the world, to six or seven years later, sitting confidently in an accident and emergency room or a casualty room, saying to a mother with a baby with confidence, um, give the child two spoons of paracetamol and they'll be fine, you know, go home. It's nothing to worry about. And, you know, what process, how do you acquire that knowledge? How do you acquire that confidence? And what I found as I started working on the book and I was trying to write it was that I couldn't say with any degree of certainty that this was where I acquired that knowledge or this was where I acquired that confidence. And so all I felt I could do was just to tell the story of what happened to me between when I got into medical school and when I qualified as a doctor in the hope that perhaps readers or people more um, astute than I am might be able to pick out what it was that led to that transformation. But I suspect that actually the reality was that it isn't one single thing or one single experience and it's actually that strange alchemy um, of different experiences of the process of learning both by doing and by um, failing and of passing of all the exams that you go through of watching um, as is often talked about medicine as an apprenticeship. So I think that's one aspect of it all. But the other aspect I find interesting is that, you know, I've talked about the privilege of my upbringing, of the education I had. But one of the things that became obvious to me as well was, if you like, the things that I was not taught about. And I think it's something that's very pertinent um, in this time when people often talk about the decolonization of curriculums and people sometimes think it's just a gimmick or it's just words or it's just a phrase. And I actually, from my personal experience, think it's much more than that because as I said, I grew up in a university campus. This was about 20 years after Nigeria had become independent. And yet uh, I was taught in my history classes in primary school that things like Mungo Park, a Scottish um, expedition you know, explorer, discovered the River Niger. And it was only as an adult I started reflecting on it and thinking, how on earth could Nigerians be teaching Nigerian children that a Scottish explorer discovered the River Niger, a river that for hundreds of years before Mungu Park's great-great-grandfather was born, you know, Nigerians and the ancestors of Nigerians had been bath bathing, sailing, cooking, traveling, swimming in that same river. And, you know, in similar vein, you know, we talked about different things that were achieved by various, you know, English missionaries in Nigeria. But at the same time, no one told me that there had been an Oba of Benin, the Benin Kingdom, which covered part of what is today Nigeria. But in the 15th century, there was an Oba of Benin who spoke fluent Portuguese because he had been sent by his father with an ambassador to the court of the King of Portugal in Lisbon, and they had exchanged ambassadors. And nobody told me about the accounts of the first Europeans to visit Benin who spoke with such um, awe and admiration of what they observed in Benin, of how clean the city was, how wide the roads were, how they had street lighting at a time 
street lighting did not exist in many European cities. And nor did I learn until I was well into my 40s about the Ugandan ethnic group that were recorded by a Scottish missionary in the 19th century as successfully carrying out caesarean sections. And when you think about it, it was recorded in the 19th century, but we don't know how long before that they had been doing this. And this was at a time that in you know, many um, Western countries, people, uh, women in obstructed labor were dying. And even when cesarean sections were conducted, there was a lot of um, sepsis because uh, of poor infection control. And yet in Uganda, these things were, uh, these procedures were being carried out successfully. And I think that the reason why those, you know, if you like those positive aspects of African history were suppressed was that it was really to justify the colonial experience and, and, and colonialism because it's difficult to say you're taking civilization to people who were exchanging ambassadors with uh, you know, European courts in the 15th century or say you're taking healthcare to people who are conduct, you know, who are carrying out zero sections in the 19th century. And so without suggesting that pre-colonial Africa was some kind of paradise, it certainly seems to me that there were aspects of um, positive developments that were suppressed while the less positive uh, developments were um, highlighted in order to justify the colonial um, you know, the colonial experience. And I think that's why it's important to, when you talk about decolonizing the curriculum, it's about bringing a holistic view of, of what that story is. And to me, in some ways, that's part of what my mission in writing this book is, not in any such grand way, but because there have been lots of doctor's memoirs, lots of stories about becoming a doctor, but largely written from, uh, a Western perspective, and I wanted to talk about what it is like um, training as a doctor in a Nigerian setting, in an African setting. And the 1990s were particularly important because these were a period of great political turbulence in Nigeria when uh, there were the annulled presidential elections of 1993 which then led to uh, various political upheavals. And then in 1995, the dictatorship of Sani Abacha. And I'm going to read a bit about um, when the um, Sani Abacha came to power and the impact it had on, uh, on us as students then. Sorry, just a minute. Um, The Rise of Abacha. I am lying on the mattress on the floor in my room. It is an afternoon in November, a day after my 23rd birthday. The room is hot despite the table fan switched to four, the highest setting. So I leave the door ajar, the thick damask curtain remaining in place for privacy. In spite of the heat, I am trying to study. The thick blue volume Muir's textbook of pathology, a morbid anatomy text lies next to me, propped open. I am reading about the pathology of pneumonia, the changes that occur in the lung as an infection sets in. 
I rolled the words caseation and cavitation round my mouth, severing their new sounds. But the dry heat of the Hamatan afternoon is enervating, and I drift off to sleep. I wake up startled, unclear what has aroused me. The blaring radio permanently on in our room, as in most others in the hostel, is playing the closing bars of the national anthem, unusual for a weekday afternoon. I sit up on the mattress, wipe the drool off the side of my face, then stagger to the radio, turning up the volume. A familiar voice, the voice of General Sonia Abacha, the dark goggle-wearing chief of defense staff, rings tinnily over the airwaves. I rub my eyes as his broadcast progresses, aghast. Up till now, Abacha has been regarded as one of the military good guys in the chaos since the election. Most people think he was key in thwarting Babangida's ambition of staying in office. Babangida was the military president before these elections that were contested, forcing him to leave in August. It is a prelude we hear to Abacha's orchestrating a handover of power to Abiola, a president-elect. It is whispered that this is the reason Abacha is the only one of Babangida's military chiefs who did not retire with him in August. The newspapers have carried stories of secret meetings between Abiola and Abacha, allegedly to agree the handover terms, which we expect to happen anytime soon. So it is with horror that I listen to a decisively stern Abacha announce that Shoneko, civilian head of the interim government, has resigned and that he, Abacha, has been appointed head of state and commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Nigeria. He dissolves the interim national government and the legislature, sacks all the elected governors and local government chairmen, and bans all political activity and the two political parties. In this way, he dismantles the remaining feeble vestiges of a democratic civilian government, leaving little doubt of his intent. Then, warning the international community to stay away, he asserts that it is for Nigerians to solve their own problems. Offering olive branches to the trade unions, he invites them to dialogue, lifting the ban on some prescribed independent newspapers. Any remaining ambiguity about his intent disappears towards the end of his broadcast when he chillingly pronounces words that I will remember for many years. Any attempt to test our will will be decisively dealt with. At his closing, long live the Federal Republic of Nigeria, I am engulfed with a wave of despair, so deep and visceral it feels like nothing I have ever felt before. It is as if all the hopes and fears of the past few months have crystallized in this pulse of feeling threatening to overwhelm me. I feel I cannot stay in the room any longer. And from neighboring rooms, I hear my feelings echoed in groans and shouts of anger and despair. Retrieving my rubber slippers from the foot of the bed, I head out, slamming the door behind me. I do not know where I am going, but I feel I will explode if I stay in the room. Running down the stairs, I see other students gathering their small groups coalescing in the courtyard between the water tanks and the entrance to a hall. Soon we are a crowd of perhaps two or three hundred, all cursing, shouting, muttering expletives. One boy, almost in tears, shouts, his voice choking, Oh God, how long will this nonsense go on? How long? How long will we continue to suffer in this country like this? I am moved to angry tears myself. Someone raises a protest song to the tune of a popular Christian chorus, its new words tinged with ethnic prejudice, and we take up the refrain. Sanya bacha na gotiye, na gotiye, sanya bacha na gotiye, e wawosa. Sanya bacha is a goat, a hausa goat. As we sing, clapping, drumming on plastic buckets, bits of wood, knocking stones together, more and more students pour out of the hostels and from the classrooms to join us. In my four years at university, 
It is the first completely spontaneous, unorchestrated student demonstration I have witnessed. We move in a crowd along the bare earth road, across the open field to the female hostels, where many female students are also emerging, their anger equally palpable. They join our march as we form one mass heading towards the university gates, about 15 minutes walk from the center of campus. The mood is a mixture of mourning and anger. And as we sing and march, many students scramble up the trees lining the driveway into the campus. Breaking up branches, they hold them aloft, signifying our protest. A few passing cars slow down because the crowd fills the road. We hold out branches to them. They toot their horns in solidarity. At the university gates, the crowd stops suspended. Since the tragic student protest at the Amadou Bello University years before, a tacit agreement that the Nigerian police are not allowed onto university campuses has existed. At ABU, the police invaded the campus shooting at protesting students. They left four students dead and many others wounded. One recommendation from the panel of inquiry into the tragedy was that the police must stay off university campuses unless explicitly invited by the vice chancellor. In previous demonstrations, we have taken advantage of this, ranging ourselves against the school gates to taunt the helpless police watching only from outside, shouting warnings through a loudspeaker. Occasionally, they lob canisters of tear gas at us, and a few brave students run forward, pick these up with handkerchiefs, and still trailing stinging smoke, lob the canisters back, sailing over the gates to land outside, causing pandemonium in the police ranks. Ordinarily, there is an almost good-natured aspect to these protest rituals and the insults we trade with the police. But on this November evening, we know it is different. Our anger is more real, more raw than at any time past. The implied flip side of the tacit agreement is that any students who carry a protest beyond the university gates become fair game for the police and the military. So we linger at the gates, mulling over taking that irrevocable step. We continue singing lustily, but are unsure what to do next. One student lifted high on the shoulders of his friends urges us on to breach the gates, to march to government house, seat of the governor of the state, symbolic local seat of power. These are unusual times, he says, and if we are not willing to risk our lives, how can we ever demand a better Nigeria? The crowd cheers and applauds his fiery speech, and as he bursts into the Christian chorus often sung at student protests, we join him, the women's soft sopranos, in staring contrast to the deeper male voices. Today, today, tomorrow no more. If I die today, I will die no more. Our singing is loud, lively, and heartfelt, and the crowd is stirred again, moving slightly towards the gates, but pulling back. As we see the police vans begin to gather, filled with unsmiling men in full combat gear. Another student mounts a concrete pillar by the gate, his voice ringing out. He is a mature law student, perhaps in his late 30s or early 40s. He urges us to put down our branches and go back quietly to the hostels, reminding us of the carnage in Lagos when Abacha, as chief of defense, unleashed hammer tanks on civilian protesters. The man is ruthless, he says. He tells us he's a final year student with only a few weeks to his final exams. The exams have already been put back more than once because of all the previous strikes and enforced breaks. He reminds us, then pleads, our lecturers are working tirelessly to make sure we make up for lost time so that we graduate on time. Let us not sabotage their efforts. The next voice I hear is a surprise. It is my charismatic classmate, roommate, and friend, Tony, recently elected to the Student Union Executive. He has ripped his shirt off, exposing his muscle torso, wearing just denim shorts, sweat pouring off his brow. Addressing the crowd, he counters the law student's arguments. Look, I am a medical student in my fourth year. I too have spent more than four years in school, so I should be just as eager to get on with my exams and graduate as soon as possible. 
He pauses for dramatic effect, then continues. But there is a bigger question than just graduating. What sort of society are we graduating into? Where are the jobs we are going to do when we graduate? What sort of lives do those who have already graduated have? What kind of country will we live in with our degrees? No, he urges, let us not be short-sighted. Let us press on with our protest into the streets of Enugu to mobilize the ordinary citizens and show Abacha that the people of Nigeria are not pawns in his chess game. He cannot kill all of us. It is a rousing speech, but the hesitation at the gate, the gathering police, and the pauses for debate have planted seeds of doubt and fear, puncturing the sense of urgent defiance with which the march started. Many begin to reconsider, and small groups resigned, break off, beginning a slow, silent march back to the hostels. I walk with Tony, feeling utterly powerless, and as we ascend the steps to our room, we sigh, shake our heads, and exchange a hug of despair, solidarity, and brotherly love. The next day, despite our restraint at the gates, the university, like all others across the country, is closed anyway. Now, this bit I just read um, was quite an eye-opener for me in the sense that um, the night I wrote that section, I found all the feelings of anger, fear, bitterness just come swelling back. I was writing this about 20 years after the um, actual incidents had happened. And if you had asked me, even the day before I started writing this section, if I had been particularly affected by that day that Abacha took power, I would have said to you, no, not particularly. You know, it was bad at the time, but uh, I'd forgotten about it. But then writing it seemed to unleash all these feelings and thoughts. And it was actually quite scary for me because it made me think, if you have all these feelings bottled up inside that you weren't aware of, what else might also be bottled up that you don't know? or haven't really considered exists. And so that was one of the um, things I learned from working on this book was that perhaps things that I thought were settled were not that settled. And I think that, that made me also to reflect on Nigeria as a country and its path and the realization of the impact having spent so much of our time under military rule, the impact that might have had on us as a country and as citizens. I remember teaching a class um, at the London School of Hygiene, and I was talking to them about how in societies where there has been a long history of military rule, you might find that um, the citizens are less used to speaking up for themselves, are less used to being assertive and are more compliant with authority. And um, at the time I was saying this, I said, as an example, I said, you know, for the first 30 years of my life, I probably lived only through about five to 10 years of civilian rule. And there was a ripple of sympathy from the students. And I was surprised by this because I thought, who are they feeling sorry for? I mean, growing up under military rule, what's so bad about it? But I then started thinking about it more and more. And when I think about it in relation to my experience writing this um, piece, it, it, it then makes me wonder about, you know, what I now jokingly, only have jokingly said to friends that, Perhaps part of Nigeria's problem is that we are a nation of 100 million people suffering from undiagnosed and untreated post-traumatic stress disorder because, you know, so much happened under military rule that we took as normal, but was actually very abnormal. I remember as a child 
in the you know, early to mid 1970s that in Lagos, parents would dress up their children on Sundays, um, you know, as you would for a Sunday outing, and take them to the bar beach in Lagos to watch the execution by firing squad of armed robbers. And I look back now and I think, which parents do that? You know, how, how do parents take their children as if they're taking them to watch, you know, a football game or baseball game, to watch an execution? It wasn't even that they were being taken as a lesson, you know, this is what happens to children who, it was just more an outing. And I think the only thing, as I reflect on it, and, you know, I've not really seen this addressed in any kind of literature or um, even, you know, scholarly literature. The only thing I can think of is that the only thing that made it seem normal was a long history at that point of military rule. And so for some reason, you know, guns and violence were not as shocking or horrific as they ought to be. And then you think that, you know, many of those children are now adults and, you know, I don't know what impact those things had. But, you know, those are some of the um, untold stories that exist, which made me think that um, it was important to try and tell my story. But... It wasn't any of these that led me actually to writing this book. The way this book came to be was actually quite serendipitous because I had talked about how in, you know, from primary school and secondary school, I was interested in books and in writing. But by the time I got into medical school and started actively, um, you know, training as a doctor, I felt I would never have the time or opportunity to write a book because it looked like medicine had taken over all of my life. And then I moved to the United Kingdom um, about five years after I qualified um, as a doctor and um, happened to, by that point, I had resigned myself to the fact that this dream of writing a book would never come to be. And then I met some writer friends and through them, at a social event, I met a woman who was the deputy editor of one of the most prestigious literary journals in Britain and probably the world, Granta Magazine. Uh, this was in 2012. At that point, I had finished my postgraduate studies. I was working as a senior doctor, a consultant in public health medicine in the UK. And, you know, I used to attend literary events on the fringes, not, you know, I didn't see myself as a writer or someone who would actively participate. And I met this uh, deputy editor of Granta Magazine socially at a friend's book launch party event. And we started talking about books and she suggested we go to dinner, me, the deputy editor and my friend whose book was being launched. And we ended up, we got to dinner at about 7 p.m. and we didn't get leave till about 1 a.m. So for six hours, we were talking about books. She was Zimbabwean, I was Nigerian, and my friend whose book was being launched was Kenyan. So you had these three Africans who loved books and literature just talking about books and you know what books we liked, what authors, what books had had influences on us, and you know it was that kind of magical evening where you met like minds. And as we were leaving, she pressed her card into my hand and said, "We must keep in touch. You know, don't wait till your friend comes to visit again before you get in touch." And I emailed her the next day to say what a pleasure it was to have met her and to thank her for dinner. And I forgot all about it. And about six, seven months later, out of the blue, I got a message from her saying, could you give me a ring, please? And I rang her and she said, um, we are doing 
our next edition of Grandpa, and the theme is medicine. And we've had most of the entries we need for, for it, but we think it's still missing one or two pieces. And I remembered that you were a doctor, and that night we had dinner. You seemed to know lots of up-and-coming African writers and people on the literary scene. So I wondered if you could suggest someone we could approach to contribute to this magazine. And I said, OK, I'll have a think and come back to you. And then it occurred to me that at that point, there was a piece I had written, which I hadn't actually earmarked for publication anywhere, but I'd just written it and kept it. It was an essay. And I said to her, well, there's this piece I've written which might fit what you're looking for. And I tease her now because we are friends and you know, um, her name is Ella, Ella Wakatama. So Ella said to me, yes, send me what you've written, but can you find me some names? You know, she was distinctly dismissive, as in send me some real writer's names, but send me what you have. Because I remember feeling, well, she hasn't even read my piece. How does she know it's not worth um, publishing? It's got a long story short. I then sent it to her, and I went in to chair a meeting at work. It was a working day. And I was about 20 minutes into the meeting, and my phone starts going and going and going and going. And I glance at it, and it's Ella's number, and I'm thinking, why is Ella ringing me? I only just sent her this thing. And my immediate thought was, perhaps I've attached the wrong document. I've sent us a work document or something, and she's ringing to correct me. So I had to excuse myself from the meeting I was chairing, which is fairly unusual, and say, please give me three minutes. I need to take a call. And I went out, and she was on the other end saying, we love your piece, we love your piece, we want to publish it. And so that's how my first essay, People Don't Get Depressed in Nigeria, was published in Granta Magazine, one of the most prestigious literary journals, without me actually actively submitting it, or you know, it just came on a platter. And the next uh, bit of serendipity was uh, when I would mentioned earlier that I grew up living next door to Chimamanda Adichie, the writer, and we had remained friends. So she was very excited when I had this piece accepted by Granta, and she thought it was a very good piece. And she said to me, you know, when this Granta piece comes out, you guys are going to be uh, doing readings and events uh, discussing the, the, the magazine. And when you do that, you're going to be approached by agents and publishers who are going to ask if you're working on a book. And when they approach you and say, are you working on a book, you must say yes. And I said, but I'm not working on a book. And she said, shut up, just say yes. Even if it's just a small idea at the back of your mind, that counts as working on a book. And I don't know till today what would have happened if she hadn't said that, because I would have said no. And, but because she had said that, as she predicted, when the Granta piece came out, we did events in the US, in, 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 in the UK, different parts of the UK. And as she predicted, agents would approach me and say, are you working on a book? And I would say, yes. And they would say, oh, here's my card. Let's have lunch. Let's have coffee. I'd like to discuss it more with you. And publishers would approach saying the same thing. And so by the end, the piece came out in October 2012. And by December 2012, I said to myself, you have about three publishers and two agents who've expressed interest in this book that you haven't actually started writing. Meanwhile, there are lots of people who finished five, six, seven, eight full manuscripts and cannot get anyone to even look at them. If you don't do something with the opportunity that you have, I think you will never be forgiven. And so I went that December, I thought about it, and I decided I was going to take six weeks um, of unpaid leave. 
and I would go away and try to write a book. At this point, I knew that it would have to be something about becoming a doctor because I had, since I had come to the UK some five, eight years before then, I had had time to reflect on the process of becoming a doctor and my experiences and the patients I had seen and the professors who had taught me. And when I often told the stories to some of my colleagues and friends in the UK, they were often very interested in the stories. So I thought, okay, this is probably something that I could turn into a book. And around that time, I happened to read a book by um, a writer who I like very much, who is a doctor as well, uh, who is a professor at Stanford University, Abraham Vegese, who had written a novel called Cutting for Stone, which I enjoyed very much. And he then, um, I came across two nonfiction books he had written before he had written Cutting for Stone, and they described his days as an early doctor in the US. And I remember thinking, oh, so you can write something like this and actually turn it into a book. And so it was a combination of those two things that made me go away to Ghana for six weeks. And that was where I wrote the first 100,000 words of what was to become this book. And um, I went through a lot of ups and downs subsequently before it became published because that, that was... February 2013 was when I took the time off. And this book was published in May 2023. So it was uh, 10 years in between. So that's just a bit of background. I'm just going to read one last bit and then I'll open it up and people can ask questions or make comments or anything. Yes, so I will read from a bit from my medical school days. Through the eight weeks of our posting, all the doctors randomly fire questions at us. We learned to read up on the illnesses of patients admitted by a consultant in an only partly successful strategy to anticipate the questions. Wrong answers often elicit barbed retorts, sometimes raw insults. One day, on another unit's ward round, my eyes lowered in shame. I admit to not knowing the answer to the consultant's question. His lips curling into a snare, he appraises me slowly from my head with hair cut overdue to my scuffed shoes, unpolished, then asks, where are you from? Abriba I mama, mortified as everyone turns to look at me. The consultant's thin lips curl even further. What on earth is an Abriba man doing studying medicine? You are just taking up a place that should be occupied by someone who is actually going to practice medicine. All you Abriba men, with your commercial sense, once you get your degree, you will just head for Abba to open a market store selling textiles or Quaker clothing. I smile sheepishly, suppressing inward seething as the whole world echoes with laughter. My hometown, Abiba, were known for being commercial businessmen, so that's what that was alluding to. Another day, a hawking six-foot-tall classmate fails to answer a question correctly, and he is asked, what field of medicine would you like to specialize in? Internal medicine, he replies. No, you can't do medicine. With your huge size and small brain, you should specialize in orthopedic surgery, pure carpentry, where your muscles will be most useful. The physicians often dismiss the surgeons as tradesmen, crude butchers who only know how to cut, unlike they who are refined, deductive, intellectual, delicately gathering and piecing information together to reach a diagnosis. Their work, they say, requires a sharp intellect to discern the invisible, unlike the surgeons who merely cut open to see the problem and then fix it. When we begin surgery, the surgeons are just as scathing towards the physicians, who they say spend endless hours pondering clinical decisions instead of just doing something as they do, being men of action. 
They sometimes only have jokingly say, when in doubt, we open up and see. They are mostly men, unlike medicine, which has a fair proportion of female doctors. With time, we learn to carefully pick where to stand during ward rounds. Best is in the middle of the throng, not at the front where the consultant's eye falls easily, but not right at the back where the consultants correctly surmise that the less prepared students are likely to hide. We also learn to meet the consultant's searching gaze with a bold look of simulated confidence, deceiving him into passing you over to alight on weaker prey. Occasionally, we join other units' wards rounds after we have finished ours to see as wide a range of patients and illnesses as possible beyond our unit specialist area of cardiology. Neurology is particularly popular, often admitting patients with interesting, unusual conditions. The ward round is led one day by a consultant neurologist whose round glasses, sharp nose, and oddly sticking up hair give him a vaguely owl-like look. Smart in a pale blue safari suit over a white open collared shirt, he refers loftily to his time in London, training at the famous National Hospital for Neurology in Queen Square, Bloomsbury. We listen raptly as he smoothly moves from reminiscing about London to querying his registrars to examining patients. At one bedside, he beckons us closer towards the patient an elderly man peering at us with interest. Medical students, this gentleman has a rare symptom indicating semantic aphasia, sometimes seen after head injuries, or as we suspect in his case, following a stroke. Now pay attention as I demonstrate. Plucking a pen from his breast pocket, he holds it before the patient. Papa, Eforgine, what is this? Mma, knife, he responds. The consultant picks up a comb from the bedside locker and again asks what it is. Razor, the man confidently answers. We stare in wide-eyed wonder, like enchanted audience members at a magician's show. The consultant moves in for his pièce de résistance, pulling a single crisp Naira note from his pocket with a flourish. He waves it before the patient and asks yet again, Effa or Guinea? We are primed for the by now inevitable misnaming, almost ready to break into applause when the patient surprises us all by saying, ego money, to the consultant's obvious chagrin and our stifled amusement. Recovering quickly, the consultant looks around and asks, how many of you here are not Igbo? A couple of medical students and one student nurse raise their hands. If I hear this story repeated outside this ward, he pulls on his earlobe for emphasis. You will all be in trouble. His eyes twinkle. A common stereotype assigned to our Igbo people is that we are money loving. The patient appears to have just confirmed it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think my uh, the title of my essay, which actually is available online, free to read, is um, it was sort of tongue in cheek, and what it really was about was that um, although we had learned in school about depression, and we had actually seen patients with depression, somehow. Um, 
we didn't really accept that this was something that Nigerians suffered. Um, we felt that depression was the preserve of rich, um, you know, perhaps rich Western women, you know, who had too much time on their hands or whatever. And I think it's an interesting thing about how you can know something with your head, but your heart doesn't accept it or vice versa. So we had done the classes, we knew what depression was. And so basically that essay is actually about me confronting a patient in my sort of second or third year of practice as a doctor in a very rural northern Nigerian village. And the patient presents with what appears to be postpartum depression, but I find it difficult to accept that this young woman who wakes up at 4 a.m. to fetch water and cook and clean and do all these things has time in her life to be depressed. And so I keep trying to look for any other possible diagnosis. And at the end, actually, almost because I can't find anything else, I prescribe a three-week course of antidepressants and just say, you know, try this for three weeks and come back. And when she comes back in three weeks, I don't recognize her. She's completely different from the, you know, dark, morose, listless woman, you know, and, and yeah, so that's the kind of thing where, you know, even, and even when I wrote that piece in 2012, it was interesting the number of messages and emails I got, including from family and friends who said, thank you for writing about mental health because I have suffered for depression, you know, including people I knew very well. And I think there is a whole issue around mental health in, the Nigerian context, at least in the, if you like, the contemporary Western way of looking at it that we do, don't really address or accept. And, and that leads to a lot, of, um, a lot of unnecessary pain and, and, and harm, I think. And I think, you know, in many ways, it's another example of how we are left with neither one thing nor the other because there were traditional ways of dealing with a lot of mental health issues that existed. But many of those ways we have forgotten or lost um, as a result of you know, the colonial incursion. And so we don't have those traditional ways and systems and structures, and we don't accept the Western ways either. And so we are in this sort of limbo. Uh, that's neither one thing nor the other. But you know, some of some psychiatrists are beginning to kind of try to stitch all that back together. Thanks. Thank you very much.